Good afternoon, my name is Olen Moreira and I'm the Chief Architect and Fellow at Grey Matter Labs and today I'm going to tell you a bit about Neuron Flow which is um, an architecture, a processor architecture that we have been developing at Grey Matter Labs uh, for delivering on the promises of neuromorphic computing. I'll start by giving a small introduction about what neuromorphic computing is and then I'll proceed with discussing what kind of challenges we can address with our approach to neuromorphic computing and give an example of what we can do with our uh, neuromorphic computing architecture and, and what it is. So what is neuromorphic computing? Well, essentially the idea of neuromorphic computing is trying to copy what the human brain does uh, on silicon. Um, now you could ask yourself why would you want to copy the, 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 the human brain on silicon? Of course, there's always the interest of trying to build a model of something to understand how it, it, it actually works. And actually that's one of the big drives of neuromorphic computing is this idea that um, we can use you. We can use uh, 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 we can use a model of the brain to understand better the, the the inner workings of the brain. But if we think about a more uh, a pragmatic approach, one that tries to bring to the market a solution um, for problems that we cannot solve otherwise um, using the brain st uh, structure. So neuromorphic computing as as a way of of uh, that will lead to actual um, um, efficient uh, computing we have to think what characteristics of the brain are we really interested in. And actually there are a few. I would say if I try to, to choose the ones that I consider probably the most important amongst others, well, one of them is the scalability of the brain. One thing that the, the, the brain has is that essentially it is a very simple structure. You have neurons uh, connected to each other uh, by synapses. Uh, and that is essentially all there is to it in terms of structure. Then you just replicate this same structure of neurons connected to neurons over and over and over, and you increase the capability of your of your processing machine. So that's a very, very attractive uh, proposition because actually one of the problems that we always have when designing computer systems is uh, scalability. So how do we grow from a processor to a, to a multiprocessor to a many core processor? Um, there are many difficulties there because essentially we always think about uh, computation in terms of the relation between the, the, the processing itself and the actual memory and we tend to think about models of computation that are uh, rather centralized in the usage of the memory while the brain actually has a structure where all the state is actually distributed across all the, the, the neurons and that is why it's so scalable. Uh, if you look at a, a, a common, uh, a normal processor system like the ones we, we, we use in, in embedded systems, in laptops, in, in, in frames, one of the great difficulties is always actually this memory distribution, which is natural to the brain structure. Another big advantage of neuromorphic computing, and probably the one that I would like to discuss today the most, is related with power consumption. If we look at how um, the, the, the systems of the brain work, they actually are extremely low in power consumption compared with the processes that we design. Our silicon cannot even get close to the levels of, of, of power consumption that we get, um, that we get from, from a, a biological brain. Uh, so if we compare, for instance, a human uh, uh, vision system, so the part of your brain that processes visual information, and compare that what, uh, with, with, with how much we spend doing the same thing on a CPU, you get almost two orders of magnitude of, of difference. So the human brain um, spends about um, six watts uh, of power to process, to process vision. A GPU will process in the order of the 250 watts. So we, we want to try to understand how the brain works because we actually can gain a lot in terms of power consumption uh, from it. So how does the brain do what the brain does? Um, the basic model there is typically proposed to, 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 to describe the, the structure of, of, of processing in the brain is so-called spiking neural networks. These are networks of artificial neurons that uh, mimic the, the, the brain cell behavior. Um, what they do is that they communicate with each other through valueless spikes. This is different from our typical artificial neural networks that, that uh, uh, transport values through the synapses. Here, no, we are actually transporting valueless spikes. It's just a, 
a, a, a signal that says I'm here, I'm not here. That's why it's normally referred to as a spiking network. They are fully event-based in the execution, meaning that you don't execute them layer by layer. It's just that every neuron has a, a state, and when that state goes above a certain uh, threshold level, it will decide that it's time to spike. It it sends spikes out through its uh, synapses and then updates its its state. Um, so that means that all neurons in an actual um, um, spiking neural network model, they all have persistent state, contrarily again to what we do normally in, in, in artificial neural networks, where you evaluate the output of a, of a layer of neurons, pass it to the next one, and you can forget about what these neurons are doing. For most of the models, of course, you have, you have uh, recursive models, for instance, recurrent models that actually don't have that, but most of the models that are used actually assume that neurons are stateless, and that you have a feed-forward uh, network. In, in spiking neural networks, each neuron is, is, is stateful. It, it acts on its inputs, it, it spikes, and then it continues to hold state and continue to receive at the same time. And all the communication is asynchronous and based on, on, on events. And one thing that we see often uh, modeled is the, the, the temporal execution. So it is known that, that the, uh, the signals uh, take time to travel through synapses. That is an important uh, property of the brain, and this is something that spiking neural network models try to uh, model by actually uh, assigning uh, an amount of time that it takes for a signal to, to be transported by a synapse from a producing neuron to a consuming neuron. And it also, uh, the, the state of the neuron, I told you that a neuron has a, a, a persistent state, but over time in a, in a neural network, this state is going to decay. Uh, so it's going to, to, to start going down slowly. Uh, so if it is not um, um, excited again, it may actually go all the way down to, 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 to an offset, to a, to a, a bias. Okay, so this is what spiking neural networks try to emulate of the structure of the brain. That have been attempts of uh, um, designing processes um, that actually uh, fully mimic this, this, this basic model of the spiking neural network. But there are some tough challenges when you actually try to uh, um, implement this sort of uh, execution structure in, in silicon, because silicon doesn't have the same properties of of, of, of the neurons in our brains. Um, so actually, uh, some of these properties are really not um, 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 very efficient to implement on, a, on, on a, in silicon. Um, it's sometimes I say that the attempt of trying to build in silicon a brain that works just like the human brain is the same thing as trying to build with Lego uh, a house that was designed to be built with, with actual bricks. Uh, essentially, your, your, your basic construction materials are different, and because your basic construction materials are different, necessarily what is optimal in one type of material is not going to be optimal with another type of basic materials. So you get things like, uh, so for instance, the idea of spikes. Uh, if you talk with a neuromorphic engineer, engineer, very often they will suggest to you that actually spikes are going to actually make your execution a lot more uh, uh, power efficient. Because if you actually, because if you actually do your computation only using spikes, only uh, sending ones and zeros, what's going to happen at the side of the receiver is that when you multiply by the weight of your of your synapse, actually this multiplication is just a multiplication by one. So you can remove that multiplication, and instead the only operation that you do is an addition to the potential of of, of the receiving neuron. But actually, if you think about it, uh, if you're working with with, uh, with, with silicon, we have extremely efficient ways of implementing memories. So actually the state of your neuron is going to be implemented as a memory. And if it is implemented as a memory, you have to address it. And if you think about the size of an address, the amount of data that you have to send with the address is in the same order of magnitude and potentially much larger if you look at these large chips as, as the, the value. If that is the case, actually the, the overhead of, of sending a full value compared compared with sending just a, a spike is not very big actually you you send well, since most of the the, the, the cost is in sending the address it, you really don't save too much in the communication if you just send a pulse or if you send an actual word and the other part is that okay you save a multiplication multiplications are rather power hungry indeed 
But as I said, if you if you uh, use a structure like this, most of your power consumption is actually not in the multiplication. Most of the, the power consumption in an operation is on the memory excess. You have to read the, the state of the neuron, you have to read the weights, and you have to write the state back. This actually spends a lot more power than, than the multiplication that you have to do. So the advantage of, of the spiking model in terms of power consumption here is not that great. Also, um, um, very often you add this temporal behavior. If you look at the two main chips that, that are well known from uh, big companies that invested on this, uh, IBM's True North and Intel's Loihi, they, they both try to simulate brain time. They actually have a concept of global time synchronization <clears throat> that runs across the whole system. And, that, and then you simulate the time that the synapse uh, uh, takes to, to move information from a, from a uh, uh, an origin neuron to a, to a consumer neuron by actually delaying this, this value, making it wait before it is consumed by the receiving neuron. But this requires very costly global synchronization. Uh, you, your whole system have to, to, has to operate at the same clock. And it also requires another thing that it is very expensive for, a, for, 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 for silicon to do, which is the fact that you actually have to hold on to these values for a while. You have to actually store them in buffers before you deliver them. And every buffering costs uh, silicon area as, as, as registers, as memory. Um, uh, it's not like um, uh, the delay just means that, uh, that we make a slower channel for the, for the, for the um, information to go from, from consumer to producer. It, it actually just means that we're going to have to store it while we wait. So it's not work conservative. Instead of processing something, we keep that value waiting to be processed just for the sake of, of following a particular uh, programming model. And then there's another problem is that if you talk about the idea that neurons have this exponential state decay, exponential state decay is actually very easy to do in analog. Essentially, you have if you have a capacitor and you, you leave it be, essentially the the it it, it it's 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 uh, um, um, current starts decaying. Uh, it's very difficult different to do the same thing with a digital circuit where actually I have to implement this decay by, by, by subtracting values from, from the register, which means reading the memory and writing it back, which is power. Uh, um, uh, it's costly in terms of power. So we actually want to avoid, uh, avoid doing that. Essentially, what we want to avoid is the, the pitfalls of biomimicry. So uh, I normally give here the analogy of what happens with, with flying. We did discover that it was possible to fly by getting inspiration from birds, but for centuries we tried to actually uh, make humans fly by mimicking what birds do, and that never worked. You have the, the example of, of Leonardo da Vinci's um, um, flying machine that tried to actually mimic what uh, birds do by uh, actually being capable of, of flapping wings. Of, uh, and, 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 and that couldn't work because the materials that you were using to build your wings were not the same as, as the wings of birds. The whole mechanics of, of the body uh, cannot be fully replicated with, with uh, metal and, 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 and wood. Um, so we only actually made progress when we actually thought about wings that did not flap, which is essentially what, what the Wright brothers did. And that's how we managed to actually, to actually uh, fly. Um, so the question I'm asking here is, so what is actually the brain's secret sauce? What makes the, 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 the brain good at low power that we can imitate? Now, I want to look at it from the side of the, I'm talking about low power, but why would we want to have a system with low power? Um, essentially, we are looking at uh, uh, edge devices. Edge devices are devices uh, that, that work autonomously, um, that are responsive, they, they work in real-time environments where they have to, to immediately respond to the environment and to the user. Uh, because they are autonomous, they typically have to, to run on, uh, on, uh, um, um, on a power battery, which means that they have really to be low power and they have to be a low latency. You cannot just offset them to a server. So we need very fast response times. Uh, typically, they deal with uh, continuous streams like camera feeds, audio feeds, uh, um, industrial sensors or biosignals. Um, so if you look at this type of, of, of devices, what's the most important thing is low power. 
and it is uh, uh, a low uh, response time. Uh, an observation about these systems, I told you that these systems have uh, long streams of input data uh, that, is, um, uh, th that is always on, that is continuously uh, arriving, is that although a lot of data arrives, the actual information content of the data is relatively low. If we look, for instance, if we're interested in human speech and we look at the data that, that we receive from, from microphones, um, in, in a typical setup, you'll get 512 K bits per second from your microphones, but the actual information content of, of, of that stream is only 39 bits on average when somebody's speaking. When somebody's not speaking, actually, the information content is uh, zero. Um, the same thing happens for cameras. Um, uh, so if you have a camera, you're getting 79 megabytes per second on a UXGA video. Uh, but actually, when there's no color present in terms of information, we are actually talking about zero uh, information of interest. On another hand, uh, if we think about the way we, we currently do the processing of these systems, we are kind of uh, always doing what I would call a frame-based processing uh, a way of, 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 handling, of handling the input. We expect, uh, we apply as a, a, an algorithm that, that works for an image, we will apply it to a sequence of image by just applying that algorithm ind independently to each one of the uh, images in the stream. This is uh, appealing because most of the popular camera sensors that we use, they are actually frame-based, so they send you uh, uh, a stream of pictures. And it's also simple and easy to scale. You just design an algorithm that works for an image and you apply it to a video stream. But have, do, do we actually consider the fact that if, if you have a video stream with several images, one after the other, most of them are actually just repetitions of the previous one, which means that actually we are doing a lot of redundant processing. We are looking at an empty road. We are processing the whole empty road once searching for cars. And in the next, in the next time instance that we receive the next frame, we do exactly the same processing again. And we do it over and over and over, essentially wasting uh, processing power. So what I'm hinting at here is the idea of sparsity. If we look at, at any uh, sensor that provides us data, the content of information is limited. I have here an example, for instance, of, 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 of a road where a biker is, is moving around. Then uh, if we are on the road, we may be just interested in the stuff that is moving around us. If I look just at the change that happens from one frame to the, the next in this image, because everything is still, uh, from 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 the first instant that we look at the system to the second instant that we look at the system, actually nothing changes. If you consider white, everything that doesn't change and and other colors, things that are changing from the first from the first frame to the next, the only thing that changed was the position of the bike. So essentially, this is the only new information that we have in the system that we should be processing, and yet we are going to actually process this frame over and over again. So what we see here is that there are several forms of sparsity, that is, of data that is not meaningful. We have sparsity in structure. There is part of, of the neural network that processes the image itself. So we know about that, right? You can prune many weights and kernels that are actually not used in the network. But you also have other types of sparsity. You have sparsity in space, which is that there are many areas on your image that have no relevant feature that data, even, even when that data is changing. This normally is going to result, grosso modo, this is going to result in zero valid activations on your, on your neural network. So that's what we normally mention as sparsity in space. There's a third type of sparsity, however, that it's not really exploited in, in any uh, 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 traditional implementation of neural networks, which is sparsity in time. The image changes little from instant to instant, but uh, to exploit that sparsity, you actually would have to compute the differences between images, one that comes after the other. And this, in fact, is what our brain does. When we are looking at a scene, our brain is not processing over and over the whole image. It's actually just registering. It's, it's a, an event-based camera that will register as events, changes in the input, and it's going to process only that. And that is the pro property of the brain that at uh, Gray Matter Labs we're trying to exploit. And that's in that sense that we are neuromorphic because we get an inspiration from this, although we don't try to uh, slavishly uh, uh, mimic the behavior of the brain. Uh, so, uh, how do standard DNNs process the image by all pixels to all pixels? Is essentially that you move the image through several layers of a network, and uh, uh, you're going to process everything that is in that image. 
but one one thing that you could say okay but if any change because everything is interconnected in the network if something changes in the in the input image then that that change is going to require because of the connectivity that everywhere in the network i have to process everything but that's not really true because most of the networks that we use are um uh, convolutional and in a convolutional network if you think about a convolutional layer uh if something changes in one input you're actually this this change in the next layer is only going to affect a relatively limited area and uh, uh, due to, to to the kernel around the, the pixel that has changed and in fact this means that most of the change is going to be localized and it's going to be preserved downstream in the in the neural network the same thing i can argue for for pooling operations where essentially i take one area and i reduce it to uh, i scale it down to a smaller area on a smaller feature map again i'm preserving locality of change in the downstream this suggests that when i process a neural network uh, if i if i try to pro process the change between two two inference instead of doing a full inference that i only process the change of the original inference that i made I actually end up just doing uh, everywhere. I have a kind of a change that goes through the network and only affects local change across the network. And that's exactly what 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 we we want to do. In a standard DNN implementation, you get just the image, and for each image, you execute all the neurons in your net, all the synapses and all the neurons in your network. You do this for every image, even if the change has if the scene hasn't changed almost at all. What we propose is that for your first image, uh, you actually do the processing of the whole image, you go through the whole network, but from then on, you actually compute the difference between frames and you only process the difference. So the second frame that you process, you're only going to process the events that represent the change that occur from another one. It means that you're going to do a lot less processing per frame and we should get the same results therefore exploiting sparsity in time and this in fact is what the frame does it will process events not full frames and it will process only change and that's why actually you require a network that is uh, uh, resilient in state because you keep the state from the previous execution uh, and you just do a, a localized update of of the computation that you did before instead of computing everything over and over and so what we're proposing in our in our work is um uh, a, a model of execution of neural networks of actual conventional networks so we don't we don't require that you write your application as a as a spiking neural network to start with no actually what we propose is that you take um, um, a popular network say mobile net ssd uh, or yolo or something like that and then what what you do you give us just application as it is already trained and what we do is that we have tools that allow us to convert your your um your original uh, frame-based network into an event-based network, what you call a SPAR net or a delta network. It's a network that is going to be able to process uh, uh, delta changes, uh, changes to your original uh, to your original execution. So the idea is that with this we are going to exploit the time sparsity in the time series. The conversion is mostly automatic. We only propagate the changes, so we have a lot less work to do than with the original image. Uh, we require uh, resilient neuron states. That's one of the costs. We have to keep the state of all the neurons in the system such that we don't need to recompute it. And uh, you have to provide us one thing, which is a threshold, which is a minimum amount of change for each one of the neurons in the network that warrants the propagation of change. Because if if you want to propagate all the change, you're going to get a lot of noise in the network and you're going to do a lot of processing, just just processing noise. So actually you put a, 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 a threshold that tells you how much change in one uh, output is, um, is, is, is warranting a propagation of the change. So the, the essential part of the conversion of a normal CNN to, 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 to our SPARnet is just providing this threshold. And by the way, that's also the way that neuromorphic uh, computing works. If you look at those neurons that I showed you, the, the spiking neural networks, exactly for each one of them, you define a threshold above which they spike uh, by accumulation of the input. Okay, so what I show now in this video here is what happens with the execution of our SPARnet. On top, you see what happens, what, what the normal camera sees 
in the on the bottom you see here uh, below you see uh, the the difference frame so it's a comparison of what changed in the last frame a black means nothing has changed and below you see in red the amount of of synapses that you have to process of operations that you have to process for um, for a normal CNN evaluation and in blue you see the amount of synapses that we have to process if we do the delta frames so you see a huge decrease in the amount of operations especially when you're keeping to the same road or when you stop the car and of course many more operations happen when you have to turn or when you go out of a garage into the, the exterior where the scene completely changes um, so uh, what we see with 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 our SPARnet is that the amount of operations that you can do per, that you need to do per frame is much lower than if you do it uh, uh, by processing uh, complete frames, and this has several dramatic effects. So even at a at a reasonable 30 frames per second. Uh, the difference is already very large. We'll go back to those numbers later on. But it's particularly interesting if you think also what happens if you increase the frame rate. If you go for a very high frame rate with a, with a conventional frame-based approach, you're actually going to linearly increase the amount of processing that you need. Because uh, if, if I get more frames and I have to process the full frame, I'm just linearly increasing the amount of compute by, by, the, by, the, by the frame rate. In our case, however, if I take the same exact scene, but instead of processing 30 frames, I process 480 frames, the amount of change that happened in that second is exactly the same. What I got is that I just got faster updates on my system, which means that I'll be able to more uh, 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 faster uh, uh, the detecting that something has changed in the scene therefore reducing my latency, but the amount of, 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 of load, the, the amount of executions I need doesn't grow because uh, it grows a bit, of course, because of noise. Um, and some change that is not really important, but if you, if you have more frames, you're going to see small, more small and an important change. Uh, but still, it's going to be in here, I think, from 30 frames per second to 480, we kind of increase the load by like two times, but nothing compared with what happens in, 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 in this system that would grow for more than 15 times. So essentially, we can handle much higher uh, frame per second and because we can hi uh, have much higher frames per second we, we we are also going to have a lower sampling period and therefore a lower latency so does this have consequences well we cannot anymore rely on our computer architecture uh, being like the computer architectures that we designed before the main difference here is that we have we have all this immense amount of storage that we still need compared with others because we have to keep the state of all the neurons in the network. So this suggests uh, uh, an architecture with a distributed memory and with lots of memory. So essentially, it suggests that we do uh, in or near memory computation. And of course, in the process, the frame structure is lost. So we are not uh, processing a, a structure of data that is completely regular. We are now uh, using a structure of data that is much more irregular, which means that uh, uh, we have a lot less locality of, of reference. We cannot realize, uh, cannot use so many sequential memory accesses because we know we're not going through the whole image. So we lose some um, economies of scale there. So we need uh, uh, things like caching don't work as well for us. Network bursts don't work as well. DMA transfers don't work as well because our work works, uh, our, our network now works on receiving things that are more sporadic. Um, um, we also have, um, uh, we have to do our scheduling in a different way because instead of having a, a fixed structure of processing, we now have to do it event-based, which suggests data flow synchronization. I execute when I receive. I don't have a, 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 a fixed structure of get this piece of data, execute, get next piece of the data, execute. It's more reactive, something arrives, I process it which leads us to, uh, to the architecture that we propose, which is an array like the other neuromorphic architectures. We have uh, a bunch of neuron cores. Each neuron core is uh, an event uh, processing machine. And these uh, uh, neuron cores uh, um, communicate with each other by sending events to each other. Um, how does each one of the neuron cores look like? Well, essentially, each neuron core 
receives events, queues them, and starts processing them one by one, goes to a synapse memory that checks all the neurons that are stored in this particular core that need to be updated that are connected to this event. So you receive a value. When the value uh, is received, you check all the connections of neurons for that event. You update all of these neurons by recalculating their new states and writing back the state of each one of these neurons. And for each one of them, you also check if they go above their threshold for activation. If they go, then this results in a, a value that is sent to, to an excel memory that checks to which other processes these values have to be sent to be processed by the next layer. This is essentially the, the basic architecture of neuron core and neuron flow core. Um, so we have actually made a demonstrator for this. We have a cheap hardware. Uh, that implements a small instance of our architecture. It can only handle about 200k neurons. Uh, it has 196 neuron cores and it's a modest piece of silicon with 20 square millimeters running at 500 megahertz. Um, it is on our plans to make much larger machines because if you look at this side, 200 million neurons, we cannot really uh, have very big applications on it. So one of the things that we have been working on and what, what uh, we want to have in our product is actually a, a dramatic increase in the number of neurons that you can, that you can have um, while not increasing dramatically the area, actually uh, with a very modest increase in area. So we know that we can do it and, and we are working on it. Um, I have here some, some results, but on view of time, I'm going to skip them. I think I wanted to show you our demonstrator. Um, I will, um... We have created an autonomous navigation scenario using a gaming engine. A camera observes a road in real time and feeds its frames to Gray1. Gray1 processes the input seen using a neural network called PilotNet and updates the steering angle for a car. This information is received by the gaming engine and the steering is updated in real time. As the car navigates this road, it is constantly updated with the steering information. As can be seen on the screen, more than 95% of the scene is relatively similar as the car moves on the road. This represents a real-world example of time-based sparsity. Gray One only needs to process the changes in the scene from frame to frame. This allows the system to consume very low power and process a fairly complex task of autonomous navigation. In this setup, Gray One consumes less than 50 milliwatts in total power to execute this task at 25 megahertz. Okay, so this, I guess, was explained in a bit more organized way than I would do it myself. Um, let's uh, look then at, at, at the, the, the results here. So we, we run this pilot net application on, uh, on TensorFlow first, where we trained it uh, using uh, uh, common tools, and we measured how many operations per frame we needed to do uh, by computing all the synapses, and that gave us 5 million, roughly 5 million operations. Uh, by using Gray1 and not doing uh, uh, time sparse, it means we continue to feed all the frames complete. This was to measure how much uh, um, spatial sparsity we had, so sparsity that is not because of the, the lack of difference between subsequent frames, but because of lack of information of interest in the image, we reduce by a factor of 2.7 the amount of computation that we want to do. And our architecture is very good at this because essentially, if you have a ReLU function that doesn't send an activation, nothing happens. We don't have any memory excesses. We don't have anything. So we truly save everything that this operation would cost. Um, and then we have the experiment where we actually try to do spatial and time sparsity in gray one. And there we really go rock bottom with the amount of operations for the same stream running. And this was at a very modest uh, frames per second. I think it was at 10 frames per second that we took these values, which means that this, the difference would actually increase if we go to higher frame rates. Um, we actually have only 20, 260K uh, operations per frame. This means that, in fact, what we had was a, a reduction of 20 times in the amount of computations that we had to do. And the amount of computations is essentially going to mean the amount of time that it takes. Of course, that we get a bit more uh, um, error in our, in our computation. And this happens because, essentially, since we are putting these thresholds, uh, the thresholds are making the system less sensitive to change, which means that here and there we are going to actually uh, 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 not get as exact results as we would get in TensorFlow. 
However, the, 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 the extra error is very modest if you compare it with, with the original uh, augmented data error of the TensorFlow uh, scheme. And you have to take into account here that it's also a dynamic system. So when you try to measure the error, if we actually committed an error in one frame and we turn a bit too much to the left, in the next frame, uh, we are going to have to commit uh, an error in the opposite direction to, to, to correct. So that kind of exacerbates the, the, the error number that, that you see there. In any case, it's negligible. Um, of course, you could choose lower thresholds to get a, a more accuracy, uh, but more operations. Or you could also increase more the threshold if you're not so interested. You, if you can live with a lower accuracy, you increase the thresholds per neuron, the amount of change that they will require in order to, in order to, 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 to send the change to the next factor. And then, and then you would get a bit more error, but you would also farther lower the amount of operations. But here we are already at 20 times, so we think it's already a very good result. So, in conclusion, so the neuron flow architecture is designed to exploit sparsity. In that sense, it is a neuromorphic architecture because sparsity is the uh, we believe to be the essential secret source of, 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 of the brain, the fact that we only process change and not uh, the whole information all the time. It also kind of, the, the structure that we have in our neural uh, network execution, our SPARnet, is very similar to a spiking neural network in that all the neurons have internal state and the communication goes through events and there is a, there is a threshold always um, uh, in, in each neuron that decides when you spike or not. Uh, we don't use other ideas from neuromorphic computing that we didn't see uh, direct applicability of and don't allow us to go from an application as we know it, like a standard network like YOLO or, or mobile net to an implementation. Uh, and it exploits several, times of, uh, several types of sparsity, sparsity in structure because uh, uh, event-based activations actually skip very easily the zeros uh, uh, weights because they are they are they simply don't don't generate event executions. Uh, there's sparsity in space because zero-valued activations will actually not send anything out, so there's no no access to memory, there's no communication, there's no processing for a zero-valued activation. And while many other architectures, you may skip the computation, but you, it's very difficult to skip the, the actual memory read because you have first to go to the memory and read it and see that it's a zero before you actually skip it. And sparsity in time, which practically no other architectures that I know of, or uh, commercial ones at least, uh, support, which is the idea, the idea of uh, um, uh, computing the differences between frames instead of computing uh, always uh, full frames. So that concludes my talk. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you very much.